This is Dr. Curtis, and this is Chapter 2 for Nutrition Text. So I'm going to share my screen so you guys can see what I'll be talking about for this lecture. All right, so we're going to be defining and measuring energy. Okay, so this chapter is mainly what you would call metabolism, although we're going to call it bioenergetics for the sake of the text that we are in. And, that, and so some of the terms that you've learned in previous classes, I'll explain how they use different terminology in this chapter. All right, so we're going to define and explain bioenergetics. Basically, bioenergetics is, like I said, it's just like metab it's metabolism. We'll talk about ATP. All right, so the most simplest form of energy that we use, what a calorie is, what a kilocalorie is, and other energy-related terms. We'll explain the concepts of conservation of energy and how the concept applies to energy utilization in the body. Identify primary sources of energy in the body. Explain how it is used by the skeletal muscle during exercise. Explain resynthesis of ATP. So when we've broken down ATP and now you have an inorganic phosphate, you've got ADP, how do we basically recycle that and reform more energy that we can use again, okay? And we'll talk about the different, we've got three major energy systems we use. We have one that we can get, we can break down into um, two systems as part of that system is anaerobic, the other part is aerobic. And then we'll explain how the energy content of food and energy expenditure are measured directly, indirectly, and how estimates can be made more accurately. We'll list and explain components of energy balance equations, explain resting metabolic rates, the factors that influence those resting metabolic rates, on athletes, explain the impact of physical activity on energy expenditure, which is basically what you guys are always trying to get everybody to understand and calculate an estimated energy requirement for 24 hour period using simple formulas. Again, the calculations are not perfectly accurate. It's, it's a lot of guesstimation and this is where people are gonna get frustrated because they're going to, you can use many different ways to calculate it and sometimes you'll over calculate, people lose weight, you'll under calculate, they'll continue to gain weight, so on and so forth and again, so, when you understand that the science is estimation, because every human body is different and our body's metabolic needs change from day to day because the things we do influence our energy needs, our expenditure, even if we eat the same foods every single day, we don't do exactly the same thing every single day. And even if you try to mimic the exact same thing that you do every single day, you may have more stress one day than another, so that's going to change some hormones and the way your body acts and reacts to things. Your heart rate will be at, at a different level during a more stressful day, even though you did the exact same thing on Tuesday as you did on Monday. What you did the day before will influence what you do. So again, whatever you did on Monday will influence Tuesday. So again, this is where folks have a lot of trouble with these things. Um, one, not only understanding, but the frustration in in having people practice this and, and when you're helping folks with trying to figure out how do I lose weight, how do I gain weight, or how do I maintain weight, this is where people have a lot of trouble and this is where you're going to have to be one patient with them and then also explain to them that we have science, we have math, and then we also have the art of applying this because the human body does not always add up to the exact math that we want to use and the science that we want to use because our bodies act and react and they change each and every day. Okay, so bioenergetics is the ability to convert food into biologically useful forms of energy. Okay, so again, in our other text, we call it metabolism, right? So you eat food and you metabolically take that food in your body converts it into different forms of energy. You send it to different areas of the body for um, either energy. We use it to build enzymes, we use it to build hormones. We use it to take things from the body outside. So there's a lot of different things that we can use all the different forms of energy that we ingest. Okay, so 
energy will relate to the ability to perform work, um, tasks that require energy in the body. So chemical, electrical, mechanical, and transportation. So again, your body is very complex, right? It's, if you think about it, um, a lot of times it's like a car, right? If you think about a car, we have chemical reactions that happen when the gasoline enters the motor and you start burning up that. You have the electrical system in your car. You have the mechanical properties of the car. So you think about converting energy so that the wheels are turned and you're able to then the last part of here, transportation, the car transport itself. Same thing. Your body transports you from point A to point B, or you take a box and you transport that box from the ground up to a shelf. Those are all transportations that your body will do. So energy concepts. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It's transformed from one type to another. Right, so this is uh, Newton's first law of thermodynamics. And again, it's one of those things we call the conservation of energy. We don't make it and we don't destroy it. We just change the forms of it. Okay, so ATP is our, our main source of energy when we get down to the smallest bit. So whether you eat fats, proteins, carbohydrates, and you break those things down either into amino acids or triglycerides or glucose or whatever that is, all of those represent a certain amount of ATP in your body. And that ATP is either converted to ADP as you use energy, or we can rephosphorylate it back to AD, or to ATP from ADP. So humans relatively are inefficient energy conservation. Just like your car, your if you your body is constantly trying to keep itself at a certain temperature. Your car doesn't want to overheat, okay? So we try to keep our body at 98.6. We use most of our energy to keep our body in a state of homeostasis so that things do not get out of whack to where our body would get sick, okay? If you're too hot or too cold, your body starts to shut down. So that is one of the things that your body is very inefficient at. At the same time, your body is always trying to be more efficient, okay? So when you start working out, your body is very inefficient. You burn lots of calories because it's something your body's not used to. As you work out more and more and more, you will find that you're able to do more. And part of your ability to do more is your body changes over time and becomes more efficient at the exercises you're doing, okay? Not all energy that you have is used for force production. A lot of times we start thinking simply, okay, well, I need to go do a lot of movement and things like that. That's gonna burn all my energy. That's not true. There's a lot of energy that's just done for your body just to um, maintain. So you think about, you know, your heart's always pumping, your brain is always going. There's things that are always working in the body. Even when you're asleep or you're sitting on, you know, your couch or I'm sitting in this chair giving you this lecture. Uh, we have potential energy. So this is our stored energy. Most of us do not like to have a lot of potential energy. I guess a nice way we could say when we have a lot of fat stores on our body, you, could, you know, say we've got a lot of potential energy. But again, that's one of those things that we need it, but there's a point at which there's too much for what's good for us, right? Um, kinetic energy is the potential energy as it is released, okay? So when I do a movement with my arm, so I do a bicep curl or something like that, there's a lot of kinetic energy that's going to be released during that movement. All right, we have endergonic reactions. This is where we store energy. So if you um, think about um, when we talk in the terms of metabolism, um, that would be the same as, you know, um, anabolic, right? So anabolic, so we're storing, okay? Exergonic would be catabolic, right? That's where we release energy. So endergonic is going to be anabolic, and exergonic is going to be catabolic when you think of terms of metabolism. All right, so if you look at this picture, we've got this lake with the dam, and then you see all of the the water that's spewing out of the spillways of the dam, okay? So if you look at potential kinetic, the kinetic energy is all that that's spewing out. And you can see the white foam and, and you can see how rough the water is below all the energy that's being released through the dam, okay?
Okay, and then all the water that's sitting up in that lake that's nice and calm is the potential energy just waiting to be released. Right? Um, mouse trap, same thing. As you coil the spring back, you're storing energy, right? And then you set the trap, and now that energy is waiting to be released. Okay, and then when the mouse sees and the trap sets, the energy is then released upon the fear of the mouse and no more mouse, all right? So ATP and the release of energy. So you've got ATP. We need the enzyme ATPase, right? Remember, all your enzymes have the ASC at the end. So if you ever take a class that is mainly on enzymes and you're not really sure, you can't remember what enzyme does something, usually if you just add ASC, to whatever is being used, okay? And that's kind of just a helpful hint right there. Um, so the ATPase, um, we'll have the ATP, you add in the ATPase, now we've, energy is released, now we have an ADP, and the PI is what we call inorganic phosphate, and we have to release energy, okay? So you can see ADP plus PI plus energy. Right, so when we think about it in the muscle, the picture that you're looking at right there, we have the actin and myosin filaments, right? So your myosin filaments have the myosin heads which attach to actin during a muscle. So as we have um, calcium in there, and we have the calcium binds to the troponin causing a change in the shape, troponin pushes tropomyosin away, it exposes binding sites on actin filaments. The ATP is split. The myosin head now cock binds to expose binding sites forming cross bridges, right? So basically the myosin then connects to the actin, right? When that happens, the ATP will release the inorganic phosphate and the energy, right? Um, and then actin myosin complex binds ATP and the myosin detaches from the actin. Okay, so again, we need energy to bind to it. And then you need actin myosin, um, you need the actin myosin complex binds ATP and the myosin will then detach from the actin, right? Um, again, when you're, when the inorganic phosphate's released, um, if you go down from number five to number six, you have the cross bridge flexes, acting filament is pulled towards the center of the sarcomere. This movement is this movement is the power that's created in your muscle. And then it comes back up to where the acting myosin complex binds ATP and the myosin will detach from that. Right? And then if calcium is available, um, it'll go back up to it'll go, it'll jump from seven back up and the whole cycle goes back again. So you Remember, in our energy systems, we not only release energy, but we have a recycling system that we'll get to here in a little bit, right? So we don't ever quite deplete energy in our muscles. At 70% of ATP depletion, you will feel fatigue, okay? Um, and again, is if you can get below that, there's going to be a point at which you're just going to feel like, there's not much you can do, but we won't ever fully deplete that, so just keep that in mind. Um, ADP plus the inorganic phosphate plus energy can be reformed into ATP through a process called dephosphorylation. Okay. So again, we have the release of energy and then we have the recycling of energy. Right? So we've got three systems that would do this. And again, um, this one kind of leaves out one of the systems. Um, we'll, I'll talk about that here in a second. We've got the phosphocreatine system, um, as it is in most of the books. In this book, we call it the creatine system. It not only releases energy, but is also a resynth resynthesizing energy system. Um, so again, this is a system we use for power movements, like vertical jump. Um, we use it for you know, uh, power cleans, uh, snatch, those type of things, anything that's about 10 seconds or less, okay? And we have anaerobic glycolysis. So again, the term anaerobic means that no oxygen is necessary to be present for the release and resynthesis of the energy. Um, 
sodium creatine phosphate is ana is anaerobic. Then we have anaerobic glycolysis. One system that they leave out in here is aerobic glycolysis. All right. So again, this is the um, use and resynthesis of uh, glycogen or glucose as it as we need it um, for ATP. Um, and so anaerobic glycolysis is going to be things like, you know, you're doing like a hundred yard sprint and, and things of that nature as we get into maybe some longer, um, some longer runs like 400 meter, 800 meter and, and things of that nature. We're going to go from anaerobic and especially when you're doing repeat runs into aerobic or if you think about, you know, if you're doing a high intensity interval training class, you know, like you get through the first minute or two or you get through the first uh, 30 seconds, you're still in anaerobic glycolysis. As we get into the first minute or two, and then as it goes on and on and on, we start getting it from anaerobic glycolysis to aerobic glycolysis. Um, and then at that point, as it continues, um, we'll get into um, oxidative phosphorylation. This is where you're going to switch from using um, glucose, um, glycogen glucose stores, and you're, we're going to start um, dipping into our fat stores, okay, um, and, and increase a little bit on the, the uh, protein if, if it goes on long enough. Again, one of the things you got to realize is it's not that your body completely shifts from one energy substrate to the next, but what it does is you're looking at what's the majority of the energy that we are using for our body at each point, okay? All right, so this just gives you energy units and equivalent. So again, you can measure energy in joules, um, as you can see on here in kilojoules. We measure in calories and kilocalories. Now, I want you to pay attention to the second one down, okay? And then the fourth one down. So I, I want you to get this picture because if you look at one calorie, one calorie is a thousand calories um, when we when we term it for um, food so you see that as the fourth one down okay um, but then if you look up one kilocalorie equals a thousand calories so how is that the same and that's easy we don't measure food in kilocalories um, I, I'm not really sure the reason why I don't know if it's just to freak people out you know because if you look at that um, if you ate something that was, you know, 100 calories, that would, you know, theoretically, that's a, you know, that'd be 100,000 calories. You know, if you eat something that's 1,000 calories, that's actually a million calories. So, you know, you're going through the drive through McDonald's. I don't know how people feel when they're buying a, you know, a 1,000 calorie hamburger. And in all honesty, it's really a million calorie hamburger, right? Um, so I, I think they did that just to simplify because the calorie measurement is such a small, minute unit of measurement that we'd be dealing in thousands and tens and thousands and hundreds and thousands and millions of units when we're putting those things together. So to simplify what we're talking about, um, when you look at calories as it pertains to the food that we're talking about, when you look at the back of a label, that's actually kilocalories, okay? Um, so again, when you look at this, um, you know, you're looking at the back of a US label and an Australian label. Um, so the Australian label actually has the energy in kilojoules, right? Um, R says calories. On there it says, you know, amount per serving um, 110 calories, which is actually in truth, kilocalories. All right, so um, this is a direct calorimetry machine. Um, it's uh, it's food bomb or reaction chamber. So what happens is, is the food is burned up. As the food burns up, um, there's that thermometer that change that measures the change in temperature of the water around it. Okay. So we can take food, put it in there, burn it up, and then we can figure out how many direct calories actually come from that. Right? So what's interesting is the bomb calorimeter and the human 
basically how the bomb measures food and how our body measures food for the most part is the same. Um, the one you'll see that's kind of different is the protein, okay? So even though there's 5.7 um, kilocalories per gram in the bomb calorimeter, the human calorimeter is only 4.2, right? But all the rest are, are pretty much the same. Again, we don't do the point to the point fours, point sevens, and so on, okay? Um, we use the 494 principle when we talk about carbs, fat, and protein. Um, we don't really add alcohol into that, which again is seven kilocalories or seven calories per gram um, because it's not an essential food, but again, it does yield calories. Um, so these are your four calorie yielding uh, components that you can intake. So 494 principle, if you'll remember it that way, is carbs, fats, protein, right? So four calories, um, four, four calories per gram for carbs, nine calories per gram for fats, and four calories per gram for protein. All right. um, this is a whole room calor calorimetry um, measurement area. Um, again, this, the next few slides will kind of show you some different ways that we measure. Um, this is indirect. So the only direct one we had was the, the calorimetry, the, Pump calorimeter. Um, again, this is measuring oxygen exchange and trying to figure out how much energy is being expended. Again, this is a resting metabolic rate um, oxygen exchange machine. Again, um, they're they're close, but they're not exactly right on. It's just the best way we can do it at present time until we come up with some better technology. Here's another portable RMR. Um, and again, this is like, you know, anything else. Usually the, the, the uh, more portable or ones that people can buy and have at home usually don't work near as good as the ones that you'll find in exercise physiology labs. But again, you know, if somebody's really trying to figure, you know, their, their fitness and stuff serious, then they have something like this. And here's another one as well, um, you know, I guess you could use that sort of like a, a coronavirus mask right now. Um, yeah, this goofy apparatus right here is supposed to measure calorie expenditure as well. I've actually never seen one of these in real life in the picture, so can't really tell you exactly how it works. Um, I'm sure I could look it up, um, but yeah, I've only seen it in a few of our texts. All right, so energy balance. So food in versus what you expand out. Right, so this is the big fight that we get in with everybody, you know, because everybody's wanting to do keto diet, paleo diet, um, you know, they're intermittent fasting, they're, you know, I'm taking these, uh, you know, fat burner, burner pills or whatever else, and the truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter what diet, doesn't matter what, you know, like garbage supplements you're taking, I'm not saying all supplements are garbage, but probably the majority of the ones that are purchased by most people don't work um and really the the thing is is we if we want to maintain our weight we've got to try to equal out how much we expend through what we do for our day you know including exercise or not including exercise you can expend quite a bit of energy if you've got a very active lifestyle in general um without actually having to prescribe time for exercise uh you know you may you may actually balance well, or you may actually be in a poor deficit if you need to be losing weight, okay? Um, but the problem is that what we run into with the majority of, um, especially the majority of Americans is we see the opposite. The calories in supersedes the calories out, and so over time people gain weight, right? And so that's why we all have jobs, because everybody's trying to figure out how to change that. Okay, and through both um, exercise and nutrition, right? And you know, just um, to help you guys to understand, I know I always get this question, which one is more important? Um, I don't like to say one is more important than the other. If you do look at, um, there's some studies out there that you know, people, are on, they put people on a diet, they put people just on exercise, and then they put one group on exercise and a diet. Well, the groups that tend to increase their exercise versus just the diet only groups tend to see some better results. 
Um, and again, even with some of the health markers, we, we, you'll see some things. But what, you know, I don't like that argument because you're always forgetting the third group, which is the most important group, the group that ate a good healthy diet, kept the calories in a certain range, and exercise always sees the greatest improvement above everything. And so that, that question argument that I hear people get into to me is, I mean, it's honestly stupid because that's not the point. The point is, what's the best force? I mean, you know, people are always, and, and this is where things get frustrating because you're going to hear the same things I do. Everybody's always asking me, what's the least amount of work? I can do either with my diet or exercise or both. You know, what's the least amount I can get away with and lose weight, right? And, and to me, that's always the wrong question. The question is, you know, what what should I be doing to maximize my results, right? And again, if if you don't always necessarily have the time, um, you can't put in the effort every single day. I get that. I mean, you know, day to day, there's things that come up, there's things that happen. And, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people too. But the mindset, it's, it's just that mindset. You know, it's the same thing. Like if one of you comes to me and asks me, that, you know, the day one of class, all right, what's the least amount of work I got to do to get a C in here so I can pass the class? You know, I'm like, you're asking the wrong question. Your, your question should be, what do I need to do to get an A? Now I get where if we get to the end of the class and you've kind of messed up, you know, a few spots along along the way, and now you've got an F or a D, and you're trying to figure out how do I get a C. That's different because you're actually putting the most amount of effort as you can to reach that C. Um, you know, that's a whole different that's a whole different question. You know last week of class, you know, how do I get a scene class? It's last week class, you know, what I got to get on this final or this final project or both to pass versus first day, you're just looking at like, man, what can I get away with? I, I, that's not the right mindset, but that tends to be the mindset people have when it comes to their health, you know, it comes to their health, comes to their fitness, you know, it comes to their, I guess their aesthetics. You know, a lot of people don't even really care about their health and their fitness. It's really more about aesthetics, but whatever the, the you know, their goal is or, or their focus is in being more healthy, um, you know, their, their thought process is, is flawed. And what can I get away with? What's the least amount of work they're going to do? Okay. Self-reported food intake um, to me is a major joke um, because most people are horrible about doing this because one, people do not accurately estimate their portion sizes. They underestimate how much food they actually eat. Um, I've, and I've seen this, um, I, you know, I, I'll have, I'll be at somebody's house and be at their house all day, you know, and I'll see them, you know, as they're passing through the kitchen, they just grab a handful of something and just, and then later in the day, they'll ask me, Hey, you know, I've, got, I've been gaining weight over time. What can I do? And I'm like, all right, well, you know, think about what you eat today. They'll tell me what they ate for breakfast. They'll tell me what they ate for lunch and they'll tell me what they ate for dinner. And again, even with those, I don't, feel that they really portion size correctly but they don't count like every time they walk through their kitchen and I saw them just pick something up off a plate or you know or you know they've got a plate of cookies or brownies or something they open that up really quick and took one and they don't count any of that and they and you know part of it is some people just don't think about it it's, it's more of an, a reactionary thing as they walk through someplace where their food they just grab food um, some people are just very dishonest because they, they don't want you to take their food away. Um, we take, for some reason, we take food very personally. Um, again, you got to understand this is not purely just science, um, but this is also psychology. You know, so when we, it's not, it's not just, um, this, the science of physiology when we talk about, um, nutrition and how it affects, but there's also the science of psychology that comes into that, right? You have foods that are comfort foods. You have foods that remind you of holidays. You have foods that remind you of family gatherings or gatherings with friends. There's, you know, um, there's places you like to eat when you're going to go have a lot of fun. You know, when you're on vacation, you have favorite restaurants, whatever those, there's a, there's a psychological component to that. Okay. All right. So 
we're gonna look at these charts. Now you're gonna to get to a point in some of these charts where I, I'm gonna tell you I don't like how this book makes these charts, and I don't think they're exactly correct. But we'll kind of talk about that. All right. So the the thing that they do get across on here is the importance of your resting metabolism. So your resting metabolism really is the majority of the energy that you spend all day. Um, none of y'all are gonna be physically active enough. Like if you're gonna just measure your physical activity, where it's gonna supersede your resting metabolism. Okay, um, the resting metabolism is the majority of the energy that's going to burn. Okay, thermic effect of food. Um, it's going to talk about is 10% in this book. Um, other texts will um, estimate it between five to 10%. Um, a lot of times I just split the difference and say it's somewhere in the 70% range because it really just depends again on the person, what they eat, how often they eat, and all that. So somewhere in that range, um, to me, the 10%. Um, from what I've seen in other texts and things, seems to be the high end. So I don't like to tell people, oh yeah, you know, consider 10% for just the amount of food that you eat during the day. Um, you know, I'd rather estimate a little bit lower. And again, most of the time, you know, when people are asking for help, they're asking for help to lose weight. So it's a lot easier to, I'd rather them um, underestimate their expenditure. Um, you know, and maybe even slightly overestimate the food intake, um, just because their natural tendency is to be the opposite. You know, oh yeah, I work out a lot, I spend a lot of energy, I do this, I do that. No, I don't eat that much food, right? But the problem still is, every time I see them, they're continuing to gain weight and they can't figure it out. And it's, you know, partially because of the lie that they tell themselves in these things, okay? Um, physical activity, just depending on how much you do, um, can equal, uh, I mean, and now again, there's people who are super, super physically active that are going to be way above this, but usually it's somewhere in the 20s to like 35%, somewhere in there, um, physical activity plays into it. Um, and even with that, that's, that's for folks that are fairly physically active. Um, again, you got military folks and elite athletes that are way more active than that. Um, but the majority of people are way less active than that. So that's a high estimation for the majority of people that we talk about. Right. So BMR and RMR, we'll talk about the difference. So basal metabolic rate is the minimal amount of energy needed to sustain life. Measured under defined lab conditions and its use for research. Okay, so we use it just to kind of figure out like, what does your body need to survive? Resting metabolic rate, is an estimate of the BMR. This is really the one that we use when we're, when we're working with most folks. Measured under less strict conditions, RMR is typically 10% greater than your BMR. And it's used for practical purposes. So we estimate 70% of your total energy expenditure is attributed to your RMR um, and resting energy expenditure. Okay, so your um, RMR is what we use, and again, it's higher because most people are doing more than just sustaining their life. Okay, so we can at least give them that. But um, yeah, you know, most people's energy um, is not just to sustain their life. You know, that's really what you would look at as a uh, patient that might be in a coma, um, lying in a bed. That would be their BMR. Okay, but most of the rest of us are somewhere up above that, so we'd like to 10% greater than your BMR, all right? So here's some things that will influence your resting metabolic rate, and y'all don't get mad at me because I don't make these things up. Um, so gender is a factor, as you guys will see later, that males typically have the ability to expend more energy than females, so for those of you ladies in the class, Genetics, y'all got them friends that just walk by the gym and get yoked. You know, they, they just think about it, lifting weights, they get jacked. Um, it just is what it is. You know, some people have better genetics. That's why, you know, you can have two folks that, you know, want to be amazing athletes in a sport. You know, I'm sure there might have been a guy that was with LeBron since they were kids. Always, you know, they made a he may even spent more time practicing, working out, doing all those things, but LeBron just had better genetics. Age. Um, as you get older, age sucks. It is what it is. Um, you know, your, your 
resting metabolic rate is going to go down and down and down once you get past a certain age. Um, again, going back to uh, gender factors, um, women peak much earlier, usually in their late teens and, and up through their 20s. Guys will peak somewhere in their 20s and 30s. So they have, um, guys will have a longer window of a higher RMR as well. Um, through their age where girls will start to see that decline at younger ages. Um, body size and height. Um, yeah, you're gonna be as tall as you're gonna be tall based on your genetics, again. Um, there's nothing you can really do about that. And thyroid hormones. Um, again, we can manipulate that with um, drugs and things like that, but for the most part, you don't want to do that. And to, um, you know, if you don't mess with all that, you just have certain thyroid, amounts of thyroid hormones that you're gonna produce. Um, and again, there's other, horm you know, other hormones that we talked about like um, testosterone and things that'll also play into that, but we won't talk about that in this particular chapter, okay? Um, influences under some voluntary control, so starvation, um, you know, again, if you live in a country where food is not available, that's not really that much in your control. Um, again, I guess um, some people choose to starve themselves, so that is within their control. Amount of fat-free tissue. Um, again, some of y'all are just naturally have bigger muscle than others and more muscle. So, you know, that, that's going to play into having a higher RMR as well. Um, exercise. So these are the things that are under voluntary control. Okay? Um, you can choose exercise. You can choose when to exercise, how many days, how long, how hard, all that's under your control. Um, environmental, environmental temperatures, right? You can choose exercise inside, outside, um, ascending to high altitudes. Um, again, you know, you can choose to, you know, Work out down here in Florida. Y'all can go, you know, to the mountains of Colorado, whatever you want to do. And then caffeine ingestion, right? So you can plan on how much caffeine you ingest that also influence your RMR. Uh, so these are some examples of some calculations to estimate the resting metabolic rate. Um, you guys can look at the slide and, and kind of get a feel for it. Again, I'm not really... Um, I'm not really big on actually doing the calculations and we're not going to do them for the for the class, especially since we're doing this online. And usually I might have you guys do a couple of these during this during the day that's just suggested it feels how to do it. Um, but again, because they're estimations, um, and one and two, you can always go online and they have all the different calculators that basically use these things on this, like everything else, you know, you can learn all your calculations and mathematics classes, which they make you do up until you get to through high school and college. And then once you get out of your math classes, you guys all use different calculators and other things. Well, we have calculators for RMR or total, total, total um, estimations, so on and so forth. So most people are gonna use what's more simple. All right, thermic effect of food is, I told you, this book estimates at 10%. Again, that's a high estimation in, in my estimation of what your body does. Um, and it's energy required for the digestion absorption of food. Um, this is where you get weird things about like, oh yeah, if you eat these foods, they're more metabolically enhancing or whatever else, you know, like the people tell you eat great food or you know, eat a lot of hot spicy foods and so on and so forth. And, there's a little bit of truth in that. I'm not gonna take that away. There are foods that your body um, is going to have to do slightly bit more work than others. But in doing so, I don't want people to think that you've got to, you know, cause let's just say, for example, you hate grapefruit. I'm one of the people that hates grapefruit. Um, and say you hate spicy food. Now I don't hate spicy food, but we'll just pretend I'm a person who hates grapefruit, spicy food and all other foods that are theoretically high thermic effect foods. Um, you know, is it really worth changing your diet 
to eat nothing but high thermic effect foods to elicit weight loss? Um, and the answer is going to be no, because again, at best, the food you're taking in is 10%. Now, again, this is, you're looking at, I'm not saying you're going to see a 10% overall change from the field other foods, because whatever other foods you're eating might be down at 5% or 7%, right? So you're looking at, at best, like a 5% switch, a 3% switch, or whatever it is, because you're from eating the foods you like. You know, so if we're looking at calories being even, you can eat the foods you like versus the foods you think are gonna make this huge change. And by the end of the year, you lost an extra pound. No big work, right? So under, understand that there, when I say there's a slight bit of truth, yes, there is truth in some of those things that some foods do take a little bit more energy to um, expend you know, for the thermic effect of that particular food, but it's not significant, okay? Again, proteins increase thermic effect of food more than carbohydrates. Um, again, you know, you should be eating a lot of protein anyways for um, repair, you know, tissue repair and rebuilding hormones and things like that. Uh, most people under eat their proteins. Now, again, when I say eating a lot more proteins, that's not in lieu of carbohydrates and fats. That's, um, you know, looking at making sure you're getting enough carbs and fats and you can get a lot more protein. And again, a lot of uh, research that's been done over the last few years that shows that you can eat um, quite a bit of protein, even up to like three grams per kilogram. And there's no detrimental effects as long as you have a good overall diet, okay? And again, the effect of thermic effect on of food on your RMR is going to be very small. Yeah. Physical activity. So you have ADLs with your activities of daily living. So these are things like, um, you know, getting up in the morning, shaving your face, going to the bathroom, uh, you know, like taking a shower, making food, cleaning the house, whatever you do at work, so on and so forth. All right, those are your activities of daily living. Yeah, sports and exercise activities. Um, so hopefully everybody that's in my classes has um, one or both of those. Um, as you are an exercise science or sports med um, major, you should be doing those things. Um, can be influenced mostly read most readily and to the largest extent most variable. All right, so again, um, you know, you can exercise whenever for however long, however hard, um, you, know, you can do mostly cardio, you can do mostly weight training, you can, you know, if you're playing a lot of sports, then maybe a com combination of, you know, high intense versus long intense, whatever it is, okay? Um, estimating daily energy expenditure through physical activity. So um, there's, you can do a physical activity log. Um, again, there's different calculators where you can kind of figure out um, what you're doing, like, for your heart rate, how long were you keeping your heart rate there, so on and so forth, how much work is being done. Again, um, you know, these things are estimations. So again, we can estimate it through METS, which is metabolic equivalency. Um, we usually, usually where you'll see METS is when you're, like if you're in a gym and you get on cardio equipment in a gym, um, they'll tell you like you're working at like three METS or four METS or whatever it is. Um, and then heart rate. So we can look at your heart rate and how long you kept your heart rate in certain zones and, and things of that nature to figure out your energy expenditure. All right. So on this slide, you see TE for three levels of activity. All right. So what I want you to understand here is that they're missing a component of this. So in all honesty, on the last slide, if you look at somebody that's doing a lot of physical activity, um, what you're going to also need to understand is, again, the percentage might not change because, in all honesty, your body's just more of a um, fuel-burning machine um, because of the, you know, you've got this physical activity. But over time, folks that have more, you know, like, that have more active muscle, not necessarily muscle mass, you don't have to be some big yoked out bodybuilder, but folks that have more active muscle and they're constantly working those muscles have to do more repair and those muscles have greater needs 
because of that, during the time that you're not physically active, you still have a higher metabolism in the sense that you have more rebuilding going on versus somebody that has very, very low physical activity because they're not doing any um, tissue damage necessarily to the body that needs repair work. Okay, so if you have somebody that's really not doing much anything, very little repair work has to be done versus somebody that really pushes their body. Lots of repair work, lots of rebuilding, lots of energy replenishment has to go on so that they're ready to go again tomorrow. All right. Now, again, the longer you do this, the, the more you'll see these changes, right? So consistency is, is going to be key. So that's not really reflected in this particular graph. But do understand the physical activity in and of itself is not the only end-all, be-all of the energy being expended, right? So if you look at A, sedentary, B, physically active, to C, exercise groups, um, the, the, uh, B, the B group will have a, a higher resting metabolism than the A group, and the C group will have a higher resting metabolism than the other two, okay? Um, so that's something to also take in mind that what you do physical um, or, you know, physically to your body or physiologically to your body through exercise has another effect on resting metabolism. And, when I, and also the other thing I wanted to make clear was it's not the size of the muscle. Okay? There's, there's enough research out there to show you that it's not necessarily building the muscle size and mass and all that, but having physically active muscles, having muscles that have greater needs will also increase resting metabolism. Right? Um, so this is looking at energy expenditure in females versus males. So again, you look at sedentary. Um, this is kilocalories per calories per day. So you're looking at 30 and 31 females and males. As you start adding some light activities, um, you know, activities of daily living, walking two miles a day or something equivalent, now jumps up an extra five kilocals per kilogram per day for women and an extra seven for men. When you add in to moderate activities, so you do moderate exercise three to five days a week in ADLs, you jump up an even higher. So women now go from five, 35 to 37, guys will go from 38 to 41. When you get into moderate heavy exercise on most days a week, you're going to jump even higher, women up to 44 kilocalories per calories per day, men up to 50. And then ADLs plus intense training, you're looking at 51 and 58. So you can see those jumps. And you can also see the difference. Again, we talked about genetics before in this chapter. You see how men's reaction to adding more increases even more than women's okay and again it's, it has to do with the physiology the amount of testosterone and, and some other hormone related things as well as just sheer size um, the amount of muscle mass that that men will have versus women's going to play a little bit more into that so they're going to be able to burn a bit more but the main thing to get from this particular slide is not the difference from the genders, the male and female, but to see the difference from sedentary to folks that do a lot of exercise, right? That, that's, those are much bigger jumps and you see that men and, we, men and women both react the same as you see huge jumps and huge increases in energy expenditure. So the energy contained in foods is converted to chemical energy in the body. And we either use it, use it immediately, or if you eat more energy than you need, you'll store it for later. Core content of foods can be estimated, but precise amount of energy that food yields in the human body. And when people are asking, y'all want to know exactly how much you eat, and da, 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 you can't tell them, right? It's a, it's a guessing game. And the... Part of the thing that you got to do with them is get them to, you know, especially for a while, is have them weigh, you know, they can, again, some people get a little crazy with this in the way daily, um, which that's fine, but you got to explain to them 
that especially if they're adding exercise into what they're doing as well, um, the amount of dehydration or rehydration and things like that are going to play into that. So when there's water loss or, you know, if they've been really good about drinking a lot of water, they're going to see, they're going to see some weight gain, but that weight might not be fat percentage. Again, depending on what kind of lifting they're doing, you've got muscle mass gains and all those things play into it. So when you have somebody that comes in and they're like, hey, I want to lose weight, right, well, you know, when you're trying to figure out their caloric needs, there's gonna, you're going to kind of see from day to day, their weights can go up and down and up and down. Um, but what you want to see over the, the time of a few weeks to about a month is are they trending up or are they trending down, okay? And then the other thing is too, is they may not be trending in either direction or they, or maybe they might slightly trend one way or the other. Um, but you may still be doing the right thing because again, if you've got somebody that's like, look, I want to lose all this excess body fat, but they're really hitting the weights hard. They may be losing the body fat, but their muscle mass is increasing at a very similar rate with the body fat loss. When, we're, when you're looking at it from pound to pound perspective, they may not see a change in that. So again, this is where it's important to not only be able to measure weight, but have things like a BIA or a DEXA scan or a bod pod or you know calipers or whatever else you can to not only measure weight, but be able to measure body fat composition versus lean mass. Because again, those things, they can actually be having positive changes, but they're not gonna see it on the scale. Okay, so be aware of that and make sure that you're measuring not only weight, but measuring that as well. Um, because if not, may be discouraging somebody or they're discouraging themselves when they really shouldn't be discouraged, all right? Energy expenditure can be measured but not easily. Open circuit meta metabolic measurement systems found in most exercise physiology labs um, are reasonable and practical and accurate measurement techniques. Um, again, you know, they're, like I said, most, of, most gyms will have calipers. Some gyms may have some BIAs, and the BIAs are fine. Um, they're, not, they're, not, um, they're not bad. I am, and I would actually encourage you if you have a place that has both calipers and bioelectrical impedance, um, I would use the bioelectrical impedance nine times out of 10 over calipers in most regards because um, being able to pinch somebody and pinch their fat is a very, um, it's a very precise art form that you need to learn how to do with lots of practice. Um, and it, you can measure the same person within an hour and get two different measurements. And it's not that anything changed on them. It's just, if they're not very good and technical each time you measure, it's gonna give you different results each time. And then resting metabolic rate, so your RMR can be measured with reasonable accuracy. Most of the influences on RMR are not under voluntary control or remember it's not the amount of muscle. Okay, so you don't have to be some yoked out bodybuilder or anything like that as we talked about earlier. It's just having active muscle. Active muscle will increase your RMR. Right? So you don't have to exercise for for size or girth you know, or hypertrophy, but just having good active muscle. So if you're like a cardio person or whatever it is, that still counts and it still is going to increase your RMR. Fourth intake, RMR, filmic effect of foods, all enter into calculating your total, um, your, um, your total energy expenditure, okay? Um, and again, energy expenditure group, expenditure through physical activity um, can be reasonably estimated, but again, it adds into all of that, all right? So remember that the key is the, in, the energy in versus the energy out is where you're going to see the differences in weight changes, all right? So that's chapter two. Um, if you guys have any questions, send me emails or on Blackboard, you can write on there and I'll get emails through there for this. Um, again, those of you that have been through some of the other classes, this is kind of a review of what we've gone through when we talk about metabolism in the other classes. But 
Um, yeah, it's, uh, this, this particular course, we call it bioenergetics. Um, and so, yeah, there's some different terminologies. So if you ever hear bioenergetics and endodontic and exodontic, you'll understand now that they're just talking about metabolism and they're talking about um, how metabolic processes work.